our mini series within our uh, series of Byzantine uh, lectures. Uh, it's about the Byzantium and the Silk Roads. And this evening, uh, Li Chang uh, will talk about, um, as the second uh, speaker of the mini series, and my colleague uh, Luca Zamanio will introduce uh, him uh, in a minute. So, uh, hope you're all safe and sound, and please stay safe and sound. So, uh, enjoy our lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sergiano Ja. Before uh, moving to uh, my good friend uh, Li Chang. Uh, lecture, a brief announcement, because since last year, Byzantium at Ankara has teamed up with the Orthodox Academy of Crete, which uh, issues the journal after Constantine, stories from late antiquity and early Byzantine era. And it is therefore our pleasure to announce a second event after the Christmas one we, we held together, an event that we're organizing uh, this time in collaboration with the uh, Gate of Eastern Mediterranean University of Birmingham. And it is a webinar entitled Images of the Holy Passion in Byzantine Art, which is going to be out on uh, April the 20th, and, and which will see among the speakers, my partner in crime, uh, Professor Serjan Yandem. The webinar will be broadcasted live on the YouTube um, channel of the journal after Constantine, as you can see, I mean, I share the screen. Uh, and so please go to the website afterconstantine.com, all one word, afterconstantine.com, for all the information concerning how to attend. Uh, and now, uh, after this brief announcement, so and also good luck to Serjan, who's going to speak on Monday. And uh, without further ado, and allow me to say, if I'm <laughs> pronouncing it correctly, John. And uh, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Li Chang, uh, Associate Professor in Byzantine Studies at the prestigious Institute for the History of Ancient Civilizations, Northeast Norma University, Chan Chung. Um, he received his PhD in 2015 from the University of Yanina with a thesis entitled The Image of the Roman Empire, Byzantine Empire in Chinese Sources from the 1st to the 7th century. And his research interests include Byzantine historiography, diplomatic and military history, and indeed Byzantium and the Silk Road on which he's going to present today, and all topics on which he has extensively published on. He also co-edited the volume Byzantium in China, studies in honor of Professor Xu Yihaling on the occasion of her 70th birthday. And he has extensive, uh, sorry, and is currently working on the Chinese translation and annotation of the history from Agathias, which is sponsored by the Chinese National Fund of Philosophy and Social Science. So, without further ado, Chang, it's my pleasure to, uh, to, it's our pleasure to have you here today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Luca. Uh, uh, thank you, Luca, and uh, thank you, Professor Yedim. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here and uh, uh, give a talk with all the friends uh, from uh, different places in the world. Here in China now, it's uh, uh, 22 o'clock, uh, almost near midnight. <laughs> so uh, I'm very happy to, to meet everyone here. And I also saw many friends here uh, in different places. And we, we met in conferences or in any kind of occasions. And uh, as I was uh, told before by Luca that so in this, uh, this talk, we will have uh, different people from different levels, like a, a PhD student, a MA or PhD, even some uh, scholars. So I might uh, give you a little uh, general, uh, how to say, general, general talk. So it will not be very in detail. If you have any questions, you, I, will, I will provide my email here. You can write me and I can provide you more further information. Okay, yeah, now let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, yeah, great. Right. Okay, uh, today uh, my talk uh, is titled Represent the Silk Rose, uh, Byzantium and the Asian, Ancient China. So you can see this is a very, uh, very general, very big title. And, uh, and my, my thesis was only a, a small part of that. 
from first to seventh century. But in this talk, it could be a last longer period, include the Roman Byzantine Empire and its relation uh, with ancient China. Uh, when Luca first asked me uh, if I could contribute to uh, this seminar, I was I was very happy because really it uh, uh, related to my uh, previous research even now nowadays. So I, I was thinking uh, what I could uh, write. Uh, since in recent years, I read some uh, new published works about the Silk Rose, and uh, there were different ideas. And I was also doing research related to this. So I think maybe I could use the example, use the case study, uh, the relationship between Byzantium and ancient China to see the Silk Rose, if I agree, with the ideas presented by the recent uh, publications and uh, like this. So I have this title. And in this uh, uh, talk, I'm trying to present these uh, eight aspects, try my best. I'm not sure if I can finish. I would try my best to speak fast. To speak fast. <laughs> yes. In the first, I will uh, discuss a little about debates about the secret roles. That's the, 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 the origin uh, of this uh, uh, talk, why I would like to uh, give this talk because I really saw some really uh, debates about the secret roles. Uh, I will show uh, in, in the next uh, uh, slide. And the second part and the third, uh, uh, third part about the ancient China in Roman Byzantine sources. Uh, since we have uh, uh, students, I, think I, 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 I thought they might not be familiar with the sources uh, regarded. Uh, uh, China, Asian China in the Roman Byzantine sources. So I will mention a little about that, but not in detail. And then also Chinese uh, influence uh, in, in Byzantium, how we could find through the archeological evidence and some aspects. And also related to this part, I want to discuss about the, uh, the Roman Byzantine empire in Chinese sources. This is a very, uh, very rich information. Uh, I will just give uh, you uh, also a general outline. Uh, so my uh, focus will give much more attention to the, the rest parts, fifth, sixth, seventh, and even eighth, because I think uh, uh, since there are some uh, publications uh, regarding uh, the, uh, how, so, how to say, uh, reaching sources about the, the relationship between Byzantium and China. But for the archeological uh, evidence, this is might very interesting to all of you, since most of these works uh, are published in Chinese, or even some, some work in English. So you might notice that in the final bibliography. So I think this is very interesting. Uh, yes, this is the content what I want to show uh, in today's talk. First, we know Byzantium and China uh, were located on the two ends of the Silk Rose, the so-called Silk Rose. And uh, on this uh, uh, Eurasian, uh, this uh, continent, this rose connected the extreme east and extreme, extreme west, uh, then form a very, uh, how to say, rich communications and interactions uh, uh, along the Silk Rose. And we know that actually on these roads, not only Byzantium and China, there were also a uh, lot of regions between them, such as uh, Persia and Central Asia and uh, in the west of China. So all these regions took part in, in the uh, exchange and interactions uh, of goods, ideas, political issues along the Silk Road. So that's the general idea, we know this. But nowadays, uh, as I mentioned before, there are a lot of debates about the Silk Rose. Silk Rose, as we all know, it's a modern term, which was uh, uh, created in, in the 19th century. So it was, not, it was not existed from the very ancient time. It's a, it's a, a new word, uh, it's a new word. And the first, uh, in these debates, uh, the first question is that, or most of people say that um, the German geologist uh, uh, Ishtofen, he, when he was, uh, how to say, when he was did his uh, research 
in such an area and China, he wrote his books and he mentioned the, the, the Silk Road in, in, in German, and the, which was uh, described uh, the roads connected uh, East, uh, West China, Central Asia, and India. And later on, the words uh, was popular and also by other authors and make it into public. This is the general idea what we know from most of the works. But in 2019, uh, in the journal of uh, Silk Road, uh, one author uh, who was called uh, Matthias Merton, he wrote a paper, it is called, Did Eichthofen Really Call the Silk Road? In this paper, he, uh, through this basis, he checked uh, uh, different and, and many uh, publications in the early 19th and 20th century in German, in French, in different languages. And he found that actually before Eichthofen, Sick wrote the word was, has been, ha, had been used by others. So we can see that uh, the contribution of uh, Eichthofen is that he made the word much more well known. And through him, this word became much more public. So this is the contribution from Eichthofen. This is the new East idea. And I, I noticed this paper. And also uh, I found that in this, uh, in another one, in the newly published volume of Acta Orientalia Academia, uh, Centiarum Hungarice, uh, in the volume, to, the volume 70, 70, uh, 74, issue one, it, it is a special issue uh, called Mongolia's and the Scrolls. In the first paper, which we, is an overview about uh, this issue, the author also noticed, also mentioned this paper. So I believe uh, the, all this author is right, he give right about this, but this is not important since we really know Eichthofen's contribution is much more than the other authors. They also used this word, but it was not uh, wide used, widely used. Since Eichthofen is worldwide used. This is the first, I think, debate about this. Well, the second issue, the, the road that never works. This was a, a paper was written uh, by uh, Kodada uh, Ezakhani. Ezak published in 2000, uh, uh, 2010. In this paper, uh, he mentioned that Silk Rose was made by modern scholars. Okay, this is the way we know that. Uh, further, he think that this new invention was neglected much of the regions and uh, the societies on the Silk Rose, such as Central Asia, Iran. Hence, uh, he suggests that not only the concept of a continuous purpose-driven road or even roads is counterproductive in the study of world history, but also that it has no basis in historical reality or records. And he thinks that doing away with the whole concept of the Silk Road might do us, at least and the historians, a word of good and actually let us study what in reality was going on in the region. So we can see that the idea of uh, uh, Rezahani is that he thinks the Silk Road, this term, or as a, a research field, is not helpful in our research in world history. Since it gives much focus on the connections of Byzantium or Roman Byzantine Empire and China means two ends, but less focus was given on the regions along the Silk Road, like the, the Western Asia, Central Asia, these places. Okay, but if you, if you uh, are familiar with the new publication in this uh, 10 years or even further, you can see it's not true. Actually, now more and more uh, publications give focus much on the uh, Central Asia and Western Asia, especially uh, for the sources in Sogdians, in Parawi, and uh, uh, in 
also the other, you know, Dogari. So all these uh, sources were used. Just the reason why before the focus was not given on these regions, since these sources were really hard to be read, to be uh, dec deciphered. So just uh, following the, the new published of the sources and then focus much more also given to them. I can give you some examples. Uh, in the um, work, the, the Silk Rose in the World History by Liu Xinru, uh, a Chinese scholar who is working in the US. In this paper, he gives also much attention to the Kushan Empire and the Buddhism on the Silk Road, since he was expert, uh, she, she was expert on this region. And also the second one is the Susan Whitefield. Um, some scholars might know that she is the director of uh, uh, a famous Dunhuang project, which was our important uh, uh, location in China uh, on Silk Road. And in his books, uh, The Life Along the Silk Road, uh, updated version published 2015, he uh, discussed about uh, the, the debates uh, on, uh, about Silk Road. And uh, she believes that uh, Uh, like this, given these complications, if we are to use the term Silk Road, I would argue we need to start with a broad and inclusive definition, which considers all the roads, economic markets, peoples, and politics through Central Asia, and those to and from India and Africa, along with the economies and the markets of Europe and China. So he believes that the Silk Roads could cover much more regions. And also in these regions, we could research not only uh, the two ends, but also the, the, the places in the middle uh, on the, along the Silk Roads. And for me, I absolutely agree with, with her. And I also believe that because of the, uh, of the development of the Silk Roads studies, Central Asians, or also we call it Inner Asians, and the regions around it, Words paid much more attention. This can be found in the recent publications, which I mentioned before, uh, except the book by Liu Xinru and also uh, the book by uh, Valerie Hansen, uh, who is a very famous American scholar. Her book is called The Sick Road, A New History. And in this book, uh, she mentioned uh, the, the Western regions and also with the Central Asia, the Saudis. So you can see that uh, the research on Silk Roads now, step by step, turn to the other regions uh, along the Silk Roads, not only the two ends. So this is what we can see. And uh, to the next, a road or a network. This is obviously, we believe that it now it is a Silk Roads is a network. It is not only a road. It's not a, a road what we can see. It's just a, a network. There are many, how to say, uh, not only commercial uh, roads, but also roads, you know, for uh, exchanging ideas uh, and exchanging other uh, things. That's like, like the um, Professor Frank Pan's new book mentioned, you know, there were many names of the roads. So it's a systematic network connecting the, uh, whole Euro-Asian step, the uh, Euro-Asian continent, and also Susan Whitefield mentioned Africa was also included inside So for this. And then silk was the main product or just a minor one. And in the past, in previous research, uh, much scholars mentioned that silk roads was a uh, very uh, important and a main product on the silk road. But uh, Barry Hansen in his book, uh, in the Silk, the Silk Road, A New History, she used uh, the um, archives, which was discovered in the west of China, Xinjiang province, and some, some, some Saudian documents. She believes that Silk Road was never, uh, how to say, was, was never a very important uh, uh, goods in Buck. And there were very few, but just because the Silk was very expensive and could be used as currency. So the price was expensive. That's the reason. 
And sometimes uh, sucrose was also used as a kind of uh, uh, goods for diplomatic uh, uh, means. That's the reason why it was important. So uh, on the Silk Road, silk was only one of them. There were also others, gold, uh, gold silver uh, stuff, and even fur, glass, so many things. Uh, things, as we mentioned before, at the beginning, the road was coined like Silk Road. So it became a, a general term well, accepted by uh, us uh, like this. And it's significant to the world history, especially global history. Uh, some people just wonder uh, its significance. But as I mentioned uh, in the recent publication, you will notice that uh, the Silk Road studies Silk Road or Silk Road studies with the further development of this, you can see, it's really have very important significance to the world history. Through this, we can see how the world, uh, how to say, uh, not only goods, but also ideas and uh, arts uh, moved uh, uh, along the Silk Road on the Euro-Asian continent. It helped the development of ancient world and also help us to understand the world history much better. So this is the general uh, idea about the debates on the Silk Road, Silk Roads. Okay, now I will uh, follow my slides to go on step by step to see uh, the further information, especially the, the case study on the ancient, uh, the Roman Byzantine. Roman Byzantine Empire and ancient China. So first, first for the ancient China in the Roman Byzantine sources. As we know, uh, in the uh, late uh, Roman Republic and uh, early Roman uh, Empire, there were a lot of sources mentioned uh, uh, the Silk and the Cides, uh, the country of the Silk, which was believed to be China. And later uh, in the early Roman Empire and Byzantium. In this source, you can see uh, these names were mentioned. In Petipolis of the Erythrean Sea, Sine was mentioned. Uh, in this book, you can see that it mentioned Sine was a, a place uh, even further to the India and where produced the silk. So, which was believed that, part, that should be the China, but exact location was not sure now. Later on, in uh, sixth and seventh century, in, especially in these sources, four sources, you can see that uh, China was mentioned in this name, Chinistan, Chinitsa, in Cosmos, in the God Bless days. In Procopius, the very famous story of the stolen, whatever, <laughs> the stolen, the, the silk worm uh, was called from Selinda. And Theophanes of Byzantium, also similar, but uh, uh, a similar story uh, with uh, Procopius, but a little different. And Theophilact Simocata mentioned Tokas. So uh, actually, Procopius and uh, Theophan Theophanes of Byzantium, these two words was uh, very similar to the early, in the late uh, Roman public and uh, the early uh, Roman empire related to the silk. And only Chinistan and Tokas are much more near to with the uh, uh, much more near with the uh, real uh, history, uh, re the real China. Mm. So, uh, and actually there are uh, different scholars give their identification with these names with China. So, Chinistan, you can could be like China, you can see that. Togas, this word is very complicated. Many scholars have different ear on this. Some scholars, some scholars say, said Togas is the uh, should be like the uh, Han Tianzi, means the, the emperor of China. And also some others mentioned other different identifications, so very different. But we can be sure Chinista and Tokas, these names are much, much more clear uh, with the uh, real part of China. So this is a general for the uh, sources mentioned China in, in the Byzantine uh, Empire. So this is for the early period. For the 12th century later on, I'm not very familiar, but I'm sure 
China was also should be mentioned, especially when the Tibetan Empire had a close relationship with the Mongolian. You know, they had uh, uh, marriage exchange. You know, the Byzantine princess married the uh, princess prince from the uh, Yerhan uh, state of the Mongolia. So that's another story. Okay, here is a map. I think most of the Byzantine scholars know this uh, uh, Poitinga map. Uh, it is uh, dated to the late fourth uh, century or early fifth century. In this map, you can see it mentioned uh, also in the far east. Uh, this part mentioned Sera, can I see clear? Sera uh, Mayor. This part is extreme east, almost here. Also. Uh, was identified as China. So you can see that uh, the image of China in the Roman Byzantine sources uh, is not very clear, but uh, relatively clear. Why? Because India, India, India was sure, and since India had, had a much more close relationship with the Roman Byzantine Empire. So in the image made by the Roman Byzantine Empire, China was to the east of India. So this is the location we can know uh, from this. And uh, to the other aspect, China's influence uh, to the Byzantium, I can see in two parts, in technology and art. So here is a image of a bird, which is called Fenghuang. So this is a Chinese name. This bird is not real, it's a magic bird in Chinese history. And some scholars, Walker, uh, Alicia Walker, and also Chinese scholar Lin Yin, believe that this standing Fenghuang image in the Byzantine seal and this casket uh, should be the Chinese, should be the influence from China. Uh, so this image should be transferred through the intermediaries uh, along the Silk Road or transferred to uh, Byzantine Empire. So this was very late in 10th century. In early century, you could not find this. So this is very interesting, but I'm not an uh, art historian, so I could not give you further information. If you are interested, you can go to later check my uh, bibliography to see detail uh, how they uh, discussed about this. And the second part is about the silk. See, this is, I just mentioned in the previous, in the sources that silk in the story of Prokofiev mentioned that two uh, uh, Indian, Indian monks, uh, uh, Persian monks uh, brought the silk worm to Byzantium. Since then, Byzantium had the silk industry. So, uh, but the problem that if you check the publications about the silk in Byzantium, uh, there were re really few uh, um, parts, few silks in Byzantium were uh, believed to be the Chinese one. So most of them were made uh, in Byzantium or in Islamic world. So this is a, a problem. And this part, which was uh, uh, kept in the uh, Gunter Gunter Touch Deutsche Museum Bambik, this part, a, a example of silk. Uh, and also the board of paper. Uh, we know in Byzantium, paper uh, was used in 11th century and later. But some scholars suppose that it was used also in the 9th century, but we didn't find any archaeological evidence. This one is an example uh, from the, uh, the monastery of Laura from Mount Athos. This is a paper document with the Jariso Bureau of Constantine Monomachos. This is a, the, the earliest paper document we find in Byzantine Empire. There is also another example where it's a um, donated document, maybe in uh, 1034, I think, uh, was also paper one. Uh, we can now see that Byzantium used Chinese paper, but this technology, uh, this, uh, uh, this the paper, this, uh, this writing material technology should be come from China. Uh, we all know the famous story that uh, after the, the, the war between the Arabs and China, 
751, China was defeated and the Arabs captured Chinese soldiers and also some uh, uh, workers in which they believe that they should be the workers who are good at uh, making paper. But this story has been believed now by, uh, according to the, uh, the latest research that we believe that this story is not, is not right. Actually, the paper making uh, had been existed in the Arab, Arab, Arabic world before 751. And, but after that, after 751, this, this, year, this, this time, the Arabs uh, knew Chinese technology on this. So they just uh, improved their technology. After that, in ninth century, people in industries was widespread in the Arabic world. From there, the Byzantium got the paper. So this is a, a, a general story about this. I have a paper about this. So you can later check my paper. So that's the, uh, the only uh, evidence I, I can show you about uh, the Chinese uh, influence uh, in uh, Byzantium. Uh, later on, you will see compared with the uh, Chinese information and Chinese archeological evidence, really Byzantium uh, has little information and uh, influence from China. Now let's go to the uh, fourth one the Roman Byzantine Empire in Chinese sources. So I think this is the, uh, the most uh, uh, well-researched one, well-studied one. And in Chinese sources, you can see uh, there are two words uh, mentioned in Chinese sources related to the Roman Byzantine Empire. First is Daqin, the second is a Fulin. Daqin was the uh, word used for the early period from first century to the seventh century. And uh, later on, Fulin, this word was used until uh, the Ming Dynasty, uh, 17th century. So after the, the, the fall of the uh, Empire. And in Chinese sources, the image of, of, of Daqin and Fulin could be used two terms to, to describe. State to the west of Sin. Here, scholars believe that the sea should be the Mediterranean, but some others also believe it could be impression in Gulf. So it's a little confusing little, yeah. And another image is the treasure state. In Chinese sources mentioned that uh, Fulin, this, this state was full of treasures, uh, jewelry, gold, silver, uh, like this. Now let me go to a little detail. So Da Qin, this Chinese word means great Qin, means great China. It first mentioned in the Chinese text for a mission at the end of the first century, mentioned uh, a Chinese, uh, um, how is it, a Chinese man as envoy to Daqin, mentioned that. And the Daqin was mentioned, it was located to the west of Anxi. Anxi, it is sure in Chinese sources about Parthia. So from this source, we know that this state should be uh, the uh, Roman Empire. And also uh, it has other information. So in these sources, Da Qin means Great China. Uh, means what? So uh, Qin, we know Qin, some China means China. So in these sources about Da Qin, they describe that Da Qin is a, a big China, even bigger, called Greater China, or Great China. It is a place admired by us. So uh, with the Chinese sources that, uh, this image was left uh, in a 15th century uh, publication. Actually, you can see uh, this, this clothes and uh, even the, the looking uh, is not uh, the Roman. It could be a Chinese. So it can be, it means that China really did not know clear about the Roman Byzantine Empire. They just know a proper uh, location to the west of Parthia. So this is the, 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 the information, what we, we know in Chinese sources. And also with the same information, they also, Chinese also made a, a map. Here in the center is a China. So this is according uh, the ancient China, uh, uh, Sino central, central, centralism. And the Dachin is here, located to the 
extreme west. So the, the state to the west of sea. So here is the sea and here is the Persia. That's the reason it is believed to be the uh, Roman Empire. But we, we, we are sure this map is not exactly right. Just a, a, a proper uh, idea uh, about the location. So all this information, as I mentioned just now uh, about the Daqin, was in Chinese sources from first century to seventh century. So uh, in Chinese, uh, most Chinese official history mentioned this state. Uh, in this time, also, there were several diplomatic uh, uh, connections were mentioned. Ganyin, just I mentioned, was the first one, and also another four. Uh, only the first uh, and the third, 226, were mentioned uh, much more information. Uh, compared with the later term Fulin, and we can clearly see that Daqin was, different, uh, was really not very clear, uh, even for the uh, location, uh, for the information of the state, they are just uh, full of fantastic, uh, fantasy, uh, fantasy information, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic information. It's not, not very clear. A little on, uh, Fulin is another main name for Dachin. The image was much more clear, but also based on the Dachin's image. Uh, for Fulin, the, the, this name, why it was uh, believed to be uh, the Byzantine Empire. So we can see this is a classic identification by uh, Peliot, uh, the 19th and uh, late 19th and the early 20th century scholar, French famous scholar Peliot. He believed that uh, this is word should be from Horomi and to Armenia from Horum and to Paravi from Horum and to Sogdian from. And then in China, it become Flynn. So this is the identification for the word. So it come from Ro Romi. And then if you read the Chinese official history, which recorded fully in this uh, state, you will see that the location uh, should be to the uh, east uh, region of the empire. And in seven, seven, seven century, later on, it should be the Byzantine Empire. That's the, the theory, which, why would it, be, it was believed to be the uh, Byzantine Empire. Actually, this word first was mentioned uh, in 313. The yeah, associates mentioned uh, Fulin, uh, two Fulin, uh, one, let, let's, let's see clearly the, the, the source. In the reign of Zhongui, Western barbarians presented two golden barbarian was as tribute, which are all from Fulin. The wishes, the wishes have a strange ship with the height of person, a person. So this is the first Fulin was mentioned. And later on, this term Fulin appeared very often in 7th, 8th, and 19th century, especially 7th, 8th century, 9th century, uh, intensively. So we can see in the old book of Tang Dynasty, uh, it is described the country of Fulin or called Daqin. So look, it was connected with the previous one lies about the West Sea. Uh, in, the, uh, in the southern, in the southeast, it borders on Boli. Ter its territory around to over 10, uh, uh, 10,000 10, uh, Li of cities and there are 500, 500 cities. So with all this information, uh, scholars believe that it should be the Byzantine Empire, but also, even the image of Fulin was much more clear than Daqin. There were also some informations are not correct, uh, full of uh, fantasy. So uh, see here, I give some uh, evidence about the names, how, uh, why the name was believed to be the, uh, uh, how this name was identification. So this is a source called uh, Nafanam. Uh, this is a, a Sogdian uh, document in seventh century. Uh, in this text, you can see the third name, Frumik. So this one, it is believed the Frum, uh, fully. And then Sogdian, so Sogdian, and then Syrian, and uh, Farsi, so, uh, Persian. And also in uh, another coin, 
it was a Bactorian coin. Uh, in this coin, you can see there was an inscription from Quesaro. So this believed to be the uh, uh, of uh, uh, Ro Roman Roman Caesar. So this this uh, um, how to say this Byzantine information or Roman information was also adopted by the, the Central Asia and and also even in Tibet. And in Chinese sources, a new book Tang mentioned Furin Jipo. Oh, it's, it's according to Furin Jisuo. So it's the same like from Kesaro. So from here, we can see that Furin is really connected with this word from, and then we go back to check and to uh, Horum and to, to Horomi. So this connection is, is uh, corrected, uh, identified. And in uh, Stefano Scordosi's uh, paper, he discussed clear about the, the from and Kesaro, the use in Central Asia. And uh, for Fulin, more uh, diplomatic connections were mentioned seven times. Uh, you can see I give it uh, the time 633, blah, blah, blah. So you can see, yeah, this time. Uh, actually, uh, compared with the sources about Dachin, really this time much more information pro provide. But even this, we still cannot be sure if these embassies were from Byzantium or not, because between Byzantium and China, in the middle, there were really, really many businessmen, many uh, people who would like to uh, get in touch with China, who could use the, uh, the name of the, uh, the Byzantium to get in touch with China. And also you can see the tributes from them were mainly the, the, the goods from Central Asia. There, are, uh, very, there were very few pro uh, products from the really Byzantine, uh, Byzantine Empire. And also, you can this is, here is a mural for a, a painting from the grave of Zhang Huai, prince of Tang Dynasty. In, in his grave, there is a mural uh, described or painted the different uh, envoys from the places, regions around China, came to China to, talk, to contribute, to, to put, pay tribute. And this one, in the middle one, this one was believed to be the Fulin and, uh, and one. But if you look at his image, you could see that this uh, uh, could not be Roman, maybe an, uh, a guy from Central Asia. And also it cannot be, a, a, how to say, a, like the Roman people who are from the, uh, such a, a terror state. From the, uh, the sources mentioned, uh, the uh, Roman and the fully uh, Byzantine Empire, we can see that uh, in Chinese sources, uh, really there were um, rich information, but only the location where is a proper uh, mentioned to the west of Persia. But for the others, the products and uh, um, the embassies and even the images of them, you can see uh, were not uh, real, or were, uh, also full of imagination and uh, full of barbarian information. So really they were influenced by the, 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 the people from the Central Asia. So for the next, uh, a very important issue is about the, the coins. I try my best to, to continue fast. Uh, this is very important uh, information. So uh, in China, sources mentioned the, the, uh, the Roman Empire, the, the coin, coin. It is mentioned that Daqin used the good and silver as currency. 10 silver uh, coins equate one gold coin. So this is the, for Daqin. And for Fulin, you can see uh, Fulin makes good and silver as currency without a hole. The obverse is made of middle four. The reverse is the name of the empire and is forbidden to be made privately. Uh, in 1091, the it's invoice came twice. So look, this is, uh, this is the, the, the image uh, of, of the coin described by Chinese sources about the fooling. So it's, it's not right. It's really not right. This really was uh, the imagination. 
And uh, here uh, in uh, a document found in the Xinjiang province, uh, two fun texts uh, mentioned that a good coin as token of the king attached to the end of the later and from West Turks. So here the, the, this text mentioned a good coin was given as a gift from Western Turks to a state called Gaochang in the Western region, which was uh, at that time did not belong to China. Since uh, during this period uh, in the West China and uh, the Central Asia, there were no gold coins that were, uh, were casted. So this gold coin was believed to be the, the solidus. Uh, so it means that the, uh, the, so the solidus was used outside of the word Byzantium as diplomatic uh, uh, use. It shows that uh, really the, the solidus, the, um, and not only as Byzantine propaganda, but was regarded an important, uh, uh, how to say, trailer, or even, uh, uh, yes, as a trailer, also an important uh, token for, for the king. And uh, in Chinese sources also uh, mentioned that in the West of China, good coins, silver coins were used, but during that period, China didn't uh, uh, cast good coins. And also in the West of China, silver coins, we found that the Sassanian coins were used. Sassanian was silver, we know that. So these coins, good coins also, also believed to be the, the Byzantine uh, soldiers. So with the information, some of scholars believe, uh, suspect that if uh, the Byzantine coins were circulated in China, but uh, according to the archaeological evidence, this uh, theory was not supported. Even Central Asia, it was not supported. Most of them were used as a trailer or as kind of uh, uh, decorations. So now let's go to the archaeological findings of any good coins in China. Now, uh, according to Chinese scholars, um, research now almost uh, around 200 uh, Byzantine coins and their imitations were found in China. But among these uh, 200, only 37 are the real, the rest are imitations and also very uh, bad uh, condition. So uh, through this map, you can see from where, from which regions these coins were found. Xinjiang and also the other provinces which were along the Silk Road. So it showed that really uh, uh, the Byzantine coins uh, the, uh, the moving to China, moving China connected with the Silk Road. There are some examples for the, the real Byzantine coins findings. Here uh, is a found of, uh, in a tomb of Dugulo, a noble of Sui dynasty in this uh, sixth century. This one is Solidus of Anastasius found in Henan, a tomb of Yuan Gong. This is the, the emperor, central China. Here are two from uh, Su City, Hebei province, a Rouran prince, the wife of later emperor of North Qi. Uh, here are some of the examples of the imitations. Most of the imitations were found uh, in the graves or tombs of the Saudians who lived in China. You can see very, uh, very thin, it brackets. And uh, uh, some other example. And uh, most uh, of the brackets are found in Turfan, Turfan of Xinjiang province, where used to be an uh, important uh, center uh, for the Silk Road, where business uh, what they uh, were done a lot, and uh, the foreigners came to China, first stop, they will be in this place. So uh, in, in this place, in the graves, many the imitations, branches of the Benin kinds are found there. Here are examples. So you can see they were used in decoration, also they were held there, you can see. And here, this map is about uh, the, the fundings of Byzantine coins and the imitation uh, along the Silk Road. Here, the Central Asia is China, and here is in India. So you can see 
reason between kinds were widespread in the in the east, but in none of these places they were uh, they were used as currency. Most of they were used, and they were found in 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 graves and decorations and treasures, and so on. So uh, later on, uh, other issues to be connected with Fulin. So except uh, the the image of Fulin, the information of Fulin were mentioned in Chinese sources, and uh, the coins were found. Here, uh, there are other some uh, things uh, are also called from Fulin. This one is a Fulin dog. They here mentioned that the state of Gaochang, which was located in the uh, Xinjiang province, they presented uh, Fulin dogs and tribute to China. This uh, Cody scholars research these Fulin dogs could be the Maltese uh, terrier, a very small puppy dogs. Yes. So this is a, the, in, in the paintings, you can see uh, here, the small dogs here. Because in China, uh, in this period, we didn't have this kind of uh, uh, dogs here. So this one is uh, the Fulin Barbarian bottle. If you uh, listen clearly, you will see, you will notice that before I was mentioned in 313, uh, two Fulin uh, Barbarian uh, voices were uh, given as a tribute. So really, we, we found uh, some of these kind of barbarians uh, uh, vices or bottles in China, but it's very confusing that uh, the, the, the vices uh, used the, uh, the, the technology and the style from also from Sogdians, uh, from Persian. So it's really mixed. It's hard to uh, trace back if it is, was made by Byzantium. But one thing is that sure, Art historians, scholars could find the element, the art element from this this ways uh, about the Chinese about the, the Byzantine uh, art element in in, in the vases. This is not only this is not only this one. This is an example. And also Fulin dance. This Fulin dance is very interesting. That um, just now I mentioned the Lin Yin Chinese scholar who. Would, does much much research on these uh, uh, things, and also a great scholar, Leveri, uh, uh, yes, and also mentioned this. Uh, she believes that Fulin dance motifs perhaps were invented by the painters, intellectuals of the era, and used symbolically. Alternatively, these motifs were inspired by music and dances of the neighboring countries in Central Asia that were extremely popular in medieval China from the sixth century through Tang Dynasty uh, words. So. This Fulin dance, just the, with the name of Fulin, but the dances, the element were from Central Asia. Uh, after that, there were some other uh, Byzantine artifacts and also the ones influenced by Byzantine China, believed to be that. So this is a good golden cup with a tiger head found in Xinjiang province, believed could be a Byzantine one. This it was very uh, similar to another one found in, in, in South Russia. And uh, this golden, uh, golden ring, you can see the, the image like uh, 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 really like the, the, the great, great style. It was found in a tomb of military noble Xu Xianxiu in sixth century. <clears throat> and uh, this uh, uh, is also be believed uh, similar to some findings in South Thousand Russian, which full of Byzantine uh, element, and for the glass, because in China we didn't uh, have this kind of technology to make glass. Let's make the glass in China. We see the ancient uh, ancient glass. They are uh, not uh, very uh, clear. They are like the 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 that waves, You know, it's not uh, uh, clear like this. So the different styles. So this is believed to be made in the. Eastern Mediterranean. This is the example. We have much more of this. And also for this necklace. And uh, Case, in his uh, paper, believe that uh, this, this part should be a uh, Byzantine style. And I mentioned I'm not a hard historian. I, I just uh, uh, learned from this, uh, from scholar, scholars' research. Also, an example for the uh, glass. So uh, in this uh, talk, uh, really much information I would like to present, but it's hard to 
uh, give them in very clear uh, uh, description. So generally to conclude that on these two rows, we can see Byzantium and China really had a very close relationship. They exchange goods, technology, art through uh, the agency of the intermediaries, intermediaries like Saudians, like Persians, like Western Turks and them. So with this help, uh, the image of each of them was formed in each own culture, in uh, each own country in Byzantium and in China. But this, this, the, this image, these images, okay, were not uh, exactly real. It tends an element of the real, but also full of uh, fantasies. This is the problem. This, this is because the, really the communications, you know, was not uh, done by direct uh, way, just through the, the intermediary. Intermediaries. So from this we can see really the intermediaries played much role in uh, this uh, communication, the, this uh, relation. And I believe that with the, uh, our further publication research uh, on on the regions in Central and Western Asians will be help to uh, further uh, uh, to promote our research about the communication between the East and the West. And uh, with this example, we can find that the Silk Road was really a promoted network connecting each part of the region along the roads, which promoted the development of the high globalization. Last but not least, more and more attention has been being given to sources and even societies of the intermediaries along intermediaries along Silk Road. In view of this, uh, we should be confident that the Silk Road studies will be developed further in depth and breadth, which prom will promote much of our understanding of ancient world. And here I give you the selected bibliographies which I mentioned in this talk. And uh, okay, uh, I would like to mention again, really I cannot uh, uh, co cover all the things in this uh, short talk. I just want to give you a general impression about the, uh, the Byzantium and China, how the, uh, the relation was formed and how each other was imagined or were known, knew, known um, through the Secret Road and uh, how the Secret Road studies uh, important to our research nowadays and even future. How it's important for us uh, to understand the world history. Yes, thank you. That's all. Thank you, Chan, for this fantastic talk that took us all the way down yeah. to the Silk Road. I think I'm right too fast. <laughs> no, 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 no. You cover, you try your, I mean, I think more than your best, really fantastic talk that covers all the the, 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 uh, the main aspect. And we hope that through questions we can address more. So Sergiana, yeah. I'll let you, I'll leave you to navigate through that Q&A session. So I'll mute yeah, myself. Okay. okay, if you like. Uh, so thank you uh, again, Chang. It was a very um, stimulating and um, for me, challenging uh, talk. So uh, uh, you have generated awareness on myself, I, I would say that uh, personally. So uh, if there are questions, uh, we will follow from the chat box. Um, so far, I haven't seen. Okay. Thank you very much, Lee. It's very nice to see you again from Estra. Thank you very much for such an interesting talk. Yes, uh, are there any questions? Uh, are you receiving Luca from your personal? No, 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 I don't, I don't, I cannot see any, but I have one for Chang out of ignorance, if you allow me to say so. So it's, it's clear from your talk that uh, up to the certain point you had, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, your intermediaries, okay, but do you happen to know if any Roman visited China for real later on, or if we have any source, Chinese source, literally telling us that someone, a uh, merchant, or uh, I don't know, a deep, I mean, and we know that religious, most probably um, embassies were sent, missionaries were sent, but I mean, I'm not too familiar with that. If you can elaborate upon, upon the subject a bit, if you can. You mean for you mean for the 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 the, the, the for the Roman period? Yeah, even for the Roman or for the Byzantine period. I mean, you know. actually, just an, uh, just now I, I mentioned the diplomatic connections. There were uh, sources mentioned uh, the 
the diplomatic connection between China and uh, the Roman Byzantine Empire. But uh, actually, according to my uh, viewpoint, uh, there's no one. Uh, there's no one real. According to their name, they could be people from the uh, from the, the regions along Silk Road, for example, Egypt or Syrian or Central Asia. But there's no uh, conf conf uh, no firm information can be sure that they are uh, uh, sent by the Roman Empire. Since they are they are mentioned in Chinese name, for example, there is a scholar named Qin Lun. So this is a typical Chinese name. This is not. Uh, 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 a Roman name, so you could not know that. And also, uh, for the embassy, for the em embassy of one hundred sixty-six, it was called that the there was embassy, uh, there was en envoys uh, were sent uh, by an, by by the king Andun. So scholars be, be believe that it could be the the uh, An Antonius Antonius Aureus. Uh, uh, I forgot. Sorry, but but. The, Oh, no, sorry, I've got. Okay. Uh, I think from our next um, week's speaker from Aniket Chetri, there's a question. I wanted to ask what was the general perception of the Byzantine dynasty within the Middle Kingdom, keeping in mind that the idea of uh, Chang Kuo implied that all foreign nations were barbaric by disposition. Did this idea affect the perception of the Byzantine Empire? Sorry, I, I, I didn't uh, uh, get clear. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's about. Oh, I saw that. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask what were the general perceptions perception, within, yeah. within the Middle Kingdom in China, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I understand now. Actually, through through the information, maybe I didn't give it clearly, but it, but actually, for the first for the Dutch, the image, uh, China admired Dutch very much. So Dutch. Was a, a state to the west of sea was a matter admired very much. It could be a very exa good example for China. So you mean you know Chinese scholar wrote these uh, books were want 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 Chinese to read it. So they want to create a very fantastic, very uh, perfect image for Chinese to 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 learn from them. And later on for 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 Fulin, and it was at the beginning it was also like this. But later on, if you read the sources in the 9th century, 10th century, even later, and also you can see that you remember the image uh, in the Zhang Huai prince of town? It was a barbarian image, right? So later on, step by step, the image of Fulin became a barbarian one. Okay, because less information were known, and, the, and the, especially after 10th, 11th century, Fulin was forgotten, was lost. It was just one of them, one of the barbarians. So that's, it changed. At the beginning, it was a perfect, a terrorist state, but later on, it became just a, a simple barbarian state. And uh, now uh, there, there, are, there is one uh, new published paper in China described the, the, uh, the uh, transformation of the image of Fulin. If, uh, if you are interested in, you can send an email, I, I can send it to you, you can check about that. Yes, thank you. Thank and you. Uh, Lee, I, have, I have a question. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. Sense. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for a, a fascinating you. talk. Uh, I've seen bits of the Silk Road, not only in Turkey, but also in China and Uzbekistan. And I, I have a modern day question for you. Yeah. Um, the, the new one, the Belt and Road, uh, the new Silk Road, the modern Silk Road. Yeah. Does it, does it bear, can you say, does it bear any relationship to the roots of the archaic Silk Road? Um, thank you. It's a very good, uh, very good question. <laughs> this is also what we are, dusk, we, we are, we, we are discussing now. Uh, actually, uh, mm, how, to, how to say that? Mm. You know, since China uh, and also the other uh, countries along the, along the Silk Road, we can see that they want to communicate with each other. They want to find, a, 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 how do you say, they found a, find a good uh, reason for that. So they say that in the ancient time, China had our countries hand 
good relationship. So now we want to continue this relationship. Yeah. Nowadays, we formed this, this uh, so, so you know, we, we, we always want to find this. You can just call it an excuse, okay, whatever, or reason, yeah. So, so be, 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 with this way, uh, and then we could have uh, cultural communication, we could have economic uh, relationship, like this way, yes. If I don't know you, you don't know me, we have no, nothing relationship, it's hard to form a new one. I think it's reasonable. Yeah. It's understandable, right? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Uh, there is another question from Esra. Uh, uh, I, will, uh, I have one question. You mentioned a paper and a solidus that is attached to it. Is My it friend. possible, or according to you, maybe that would be a seal, not a solidus? Do we have any idea about the content of the paper in question? Thank you, Ezra, my friend. <laughs> very, very, very good question. Yes, yes. I, I really, I didn't wonder about this. You give me a very good idea about, it. yes, it could be a, a, a coin. It could be a seal. But I think it's very hard for the Western Turks to own a, to own a seal and then use it here. Maybe, maybe you're right. It could be used as a seal, but it was not the seal from Byzantium. Right? Uh, it, did, uh, did I explain clearly? It could be used as seal, but it was at the beginning, it was not a seal. It just only could be a, a solidus, which they, 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 they got from the Byzantine, which were as a gift or through the Soviets. And right? the, uh, yes, they, uh, the, the second part of the question is, do oh, we yeah. know the content of the paper? What's written or what was in the paper? Do we know uh, this, the, this, it is only 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 a uh, 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 fragment, <laughs> only fragment. Yes, in Chinese mentioned, it, it, it was a, uh, uh, as a token of the king to the king of Gaochang, only this. Mm -hmm. So no further. So we, do, we just can yeah. guess this. And I mentioned in this time, in this region, there was no, there was no good coin. Only Byzantine coin appeared here. So only only could be that. So based on this, it was used as a gift. Yeah. So we believe it could be a diplomatic yeah. meanings here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think that was more than. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It was very explanatory for myself as well. Um, so uh, from Lili Andraseli, hello. I'm working on an article about yeah. evidences on Roman and Wees in China. So it was very interesting. Thank you so much and some greetings. So the next one is uh, Gang Wu to uh, thank you, Li Chang. Um, it was a very rich talk and I have learned. I'm very interested in the Byzantine silk industry. I just have a short question. Do you find any evidence uh, either from Chinese sources or elsewhere suggesting how the Chinese silk industry might have influenced the Byzantine silk in industry, for example, in terms of the silk producing technology, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, uh, for us, we only know the sources mentioned by Procopius and Theophanes of Byzantium that the story which the silk worms were brought by the monks from the, in the, the, the India part to Byzantium. And the things then in Byzantium, silk industry was, uh, getting, blues, was getting blues on. Uh, so this is early information. But nowadays, we really have many papers, for example, by Economides and other scholars who are doing on the silk and silk industry in Byzantium. They published many works which discuss about the technology of silk making in Byzantium. So if a Professor uh, Wu Gang uh, uh, are interested in, uh, you are, if you are interested in, you can send me an email. I can give you the bibliography about that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chang. Uh, and the last question, as far as I uh, can uh, read from Ali Doruk Kahraman. Uh, thanks a lot for your amazing talk. Mm. My previous thesis subject, subject was Greek fire. I'm deeply interested in Meng uh, Ho Yu, Furious Fury Oil. Uh, this Song Dynasty, Vipan, amazes me, and I try to research whether there may be any connection via Muslim intermediaries, uh, except Netament Forbes, I'm still ignorant of this topic. Is there Chinese authors that I can read in Western languages? Uh, actually, I'm not familiar with this topic, but 
uh, you can send me email, then I, I can check for you. If I find anything, I will send you back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chang. It was, oh, there's another. Thank question. you. Yeah, these are uh, extended thanks. Thank you very much for the questions and also for your very detailed answers, uh, Chang. It was a very, uh, as I said, very inspiring uh, topic and talk. Thank you very much. Wait, it's Terzan. There is a question from uh, Oslem really? Chaiken. I, I haven't seen that. Is it your person? It didn't it's appear on, to uh, it, No, it's on the screen. It's, it's I mean, it's, it's live. <laughs> Sorry, um, I could have also written it. Uh, shall I write yeah. it down? Do you do? Do we have time? Uh, Go ahead. No problem. I think uh, for me. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for this talk. I I unfortunately missed the beginning of it, but I was wondering um, whether we, we know that uh, different objects have different values and different usages uh, in different societies. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm working more on uh, late early modern and modern periods and we know mm -hmm. that um, Europeans had these curiosity cabinets uh, during these periods and they grabbed everything that they uh, can get hold on and they put it in these um, um, rooms uh, as, as a curiosity object. So I was wondering, you were talking about these coins, like the solidus, for instance, and some other objects too, whether actually, um, it, ha have you looked into how these objects were used, whether there are any changes in their value or usages, uh, or uh, whether actually Chinese had something equivalent to these curiosity um, um, rooms, uh, cabinets, you mean for but coins for or for cabinets? Item, item of col yeah, and collector's item. Uh, did they collect these things? You, you mean for the ancient time or now modern time? For ancient time, right? No, no, for, uh, yes, for your own time, yes. The period uh, that you're working on. Uh, actually, uh, I, I think this, in my, in my uh, talk, I discussed about the Brazilian coins. Uh, most of the uh, coins, uh, were found in, in graves. So this is what we know. I think only uh, only one or two are found in halls. Uh, in, in, C, uh, in Xi'an, in, in Chinese city Xi'an, uh, there was a treasure hall that was found uh, inside the hall. There was, uh, uh, there was one Brazilian coin and uh, some gold uh, vases and even jewelry, uh, even, uh, even jewelry which were put together. So we believe that the owner of this one could be a nobleman. Yes, I think really uh, uh, in China, we also have the tradition of collecting, you are right. I think, yes, it, it could be as a, a part of a cherry, part of, a, for curiosity, part of the collection. But this is only what, what we have, I think. The other, for the others, were only found in, in, in graves. So we could not uh, provide more information about this. But in, you are right, in China, we really, really handle the, the tradition for collecting uh, different things, uh, exotic things for curiosity. This is sure, especially the rich people. They always had their own room for this. This is sure. Yes. No. Thank you. Thank you. And here is my email I left here. Uh, anyone is interested in any topic can send me an uh, email. If I cannot solve it, I, at least I can find you the bibliography and some other authors who can, who can answer, answer you. Thank you. Thank you, Chang, and Chang, thank you, Aslam. Um, so if there are no other questions, can we conclude this session? Uh, so we'll just have the last um, lecture of this mini-series uh, next Friday, the same time. Uh, Aniket Chetri will talk about presenting the other, assessing Indo-Byzantine thought textual sources. So uh, hope to meet you all safe and sound next week Friday. And thank you very much, Chang, again. It was a pleasure meeting you, knowing you, and thank you. listening to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you all. Good yeah. evening.